Luke chapter 6, verse 38, talking about one of our favorite subjects, just not in church. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Lord, we need you tonight. Lord, I need you because anytime you talk about people's finances in church, they bow up on you. And I, I, I don't want anything from anybody in here. But God, in order for us to have the walk with you that your word declares, we need to understand where things line up in our lives. I pray, God, not, not, not that someone becomes wealthy, but somebody audits their approach to you, God. That they survey their mindset, their attitude, and their understanding of the things of God that are easily dismissed because of our carnality. Anybody say in Jesus' name. God bless you to be seated. It's right there in green and white. It's embossed or engraved, determining on how you want to look at it on the silver, copper, and even gold coins that we have. It's a prominent feature on our currency. It's a statement of trust. It's a statement of reliance and dependence. <laughs> the wonderful thing about the Bible, the truth, the Word of God, it doesn't matter where you come from, what side of the tracks, what kind of house or car. You know that because Luke 14, 23 says, The Lord said unto that servant, Go out into the highways and hedges. Never has that been more pertinent than today. When you drive down the street, there are people living everywhere. And compel them to come in that my house may be filled. It's an inclusive situation. There are no big eyes and little U's. In fact, before I'm done tonight, you're going to find out real quick where you stand financially, socially, means diddly to God. However, I want to submit to you that most of us have trust issues. <laughs> As I stated this past Sunday morning, and emphatically, many believe God. Oh, I believe I will go to heaven. Forgive me my sins. I want to be saved. And I'm not diminishing that in any way, but can I get an amen? but they don't trust him. It's why the rich young ruler walked away. He believed God and was thankful that he gave it to him, but he couldn't believe God and trust him to give it again. That's why many others never truly enjoy the joy of salvation. They don't like offering time. They don't like certain aspects of the reason I can preach this freely. Y'all know I don't want any of money. Whether I eat or not has nothing to do with you. Now, if we're going to be a biblical church, it should be. But sadly, because of mindsets, concepts that are not biblical, the American church today is it's really in trouble. Because it's the common struggle with humanity throughout Scripture, both old and new. It's not a new struggle. It's, it's a struggle. Because the truth and what we really love is revealed in the way we handle what we value most. Some of you would not be very cavalier with your bank account, but you come in here and you're really cavalier with your worship. You're real cavalier with what, how you'll treat your money, but you're really serious about that. But when it comes to the saints of God and people in the church, eh, I could take it or leave them. Well, let's it just got serious, didn't it? Because when you actually lay that concept across Scripture, you realize, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. 
how serious we take not just our titles, which sadly sometimes is dishonest to who the person really is, but we have a pecking order in humanity that God does not have. It's that point, that, that moment when God watches what we value most that decides or disputes whether we really trust him. In fact, I often wonder if we removed him from the statement found on our money, because our money says in God we trust, but do we say, I trust in God? It seems many has filled that spot with a blank and a laundry list of items we trust more, ourselves, our money, our wisdom, our health, our strength, our opinion. I, I could go on. There are yearly surveys that bear out the fact that we claim we trust God but don't practice trust. We seem to excel at lips, lip service to God when it comes to trust because there's no real expression of that trust. And interesting, according to the surveys, today's Christians currently give at a 2.5% of their income. And if you know your Bible, you're like, whoa, that's, that's, that's woefully short. Basing that on during the Great Depression, giving was at 33 Statistics say that 37% of regular church attendees will give, which means that 63% are not giving at all. And those that are not giving are still experiencing the benefits of being part of the body with no investment. Can I say an ugly word tonight? It's not a four-letter word, but it's a word we don't like. In fact, come around April 15th, this word will scare you. Audit. Can everybody say audit? Turn to your neighbor and say audit. Audit is to examine for the purposes of verification. Now, I'll be honest with you. Most of you probably know how much you got in your pocket. The interesting thing is God knows what you have in your heart. No one looks forward to or likes an audit. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I agree with you. It would be a little bit insane if you thought, oh, cool, an audit. No. Biblically, there's a story in Daniel about a man who didn't humble himself. This great edifice that I built and he brags a little bit and he gets beside himself and he takes the things of God and employs that into his life like you know and just kind of lots of crazy stuff going on you know he brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou and my lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them these are the things of God gives all this accolades to the gods of silver of gold of brass of iron of wood and stone which see not nor hear, nor know. And then the God in whose hand thy breath is. God, your breath is in his hand. And whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified. In other words, you got a lot of trust in a lot of things which you don't understand. The very God you're ignoring is the very God that holds your very breath in his hand. If you knew that right now, God said, I require everything from you. If you want your next breath, how many would give it? But anyway, as the story played out, there was a situation where a, a giant hand appeared, and the, the, the writing that was written was Mini Mini Tekel Upsharin, which is the interpretation of the thing, Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. He was weighed or audited and found that there were some imbalances. There's a little bit of fudging going on. 
And in the end, it proved a divided allegiance and that he had actually joined the side of the enemy. Well, that's Old Testament, Pastor. Yeah. But Jesus says in Matthew 6 and 24, no man can serve two masters for he either will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Now, most of us disagree with that. Just look at our lives. Joshua makes a statement, and I use this as, as a uh, mission statement for us today, this past weekend. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will so serve the Lord. I'm not going to go in the ways of my father, and I'm not serving the enemy who surrounds me. I'm going to serve God no matter what it looks like. 2 Corinthians, Paul speaking, says, examine yourselves. Can I put it this way? Audit yourself. Don't audit your brother or your sister. Don't judge one another. Audit yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. When's the last time you sacrificed just to make sure where your love and allegiance was? Know ye not? your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except he be reprobates. Hebrews 11 reminds us of something we all know about. It says, but without faith, without faith, see, you're interchanging belief and faith when right now the faith is trust. It's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a, Use the word rewarder. Of them that diligently seek him. When's the last time you sought to please the Lord by sacrifice? You have to understand, he set before us an open door, but your sacrifice dictates the way. Many people will talk about, boy, I'd sure like to have what brother so-and-so has. Well, would you like to have the sacrifice that they gave? Yesterday was a very important day to athletes. Yesterday was cutoff day down to 53 men on an NFL roster. With a lot of really good folks that didn't make the cut. Their sacrifice was just a little deficient. Someone was willing just to give a little bit more. James reminds us, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Don't, 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 don't just say, I have faith. You're going to have to prove that. Not only to God, but it even says to ourselves. Wait a minute, I've I got to check myself before I wreck myself. Do I really love God? I need to put myself in a situation where I'm trusting God. I'm not. Anybody here struggling for the next meal? When's the last time you literally walked by faith? When's the last time you proved your own selves and audited yourself? Because someone greater than the IRS is going to show up one day with. Audits are a necessary procedure to make an accurate assessment of contextually a financial situation of an individual or corporation. No doubt it's a painful process, and since our government just hired 87,000, it's kind of pertinent that we step back and maybe audit ourselves a little bit. I'll be honest and tell you that it will be true today as well, because I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to audit your approach to God. Second Corinthians says, remember this, whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. I'm not just talking about your finances, just talking about every avenue of your life. You tell me God just cares about your giving? He cares how you treat your neighbor? He cares about how you think? I mean, I could go down the list and spend hours right there, but you have to understand some. He's concerned about the whole person. If not, if you get sick, do you not call on God? Because he cares. 
I mean, I can go down. If you're without a job, you can pray to God because he cares about that. So why is it that when we get to the subject of fine, oh, no, fine, leave, leave the God out of the finances thing. That's the spirit of the age. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. How, how's the spirit pouring out in your house? Hey, man, as leaders of our home, you're responsible. How, how spiritually in tune is your wife? Your children, your family, you're responsible. When's the last time you audited that? Yes? And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Coach. I'm not going to do it. But how many gets all excited when the offering plate goes? Oh. But we find out Sister Crow's made a cheesecake. Oh, come on now. Brother Joe's out there cooking that chicken. Oh, yeah, sign me up. Well, God's got blessings for everybody. Oh, yeah, we want that. Many of us brag about how blessed we are of God, but can God brag about how? You see, the word for him is the blessed sacrificial we've been to him. Oh, man, Brother Crow, can you just preach something tonight that's maybe jumped out? No, 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 no. Because there's someone greater than the IRS looking. I'm, I'm not trying to get you happy. I'm trying to get you to heaven. Let me finish what Paul says here in, in Corinthians. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in, all, that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound into every good word. Isn't that funny? Every. You have the attitude, oh, I got minds, we're good. Oh, boy, you, you just missed it. You missed the two first great commandments. You're void. You're not serving God. You're serving you. As is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. See, we like to talk about right. And you hear this a lot recently. I won't be saying it. Well, righteousness evades us. Bless God, I want what's right. Oh, God, that's scary. Then that means I need to pay for my sins. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get to this righteousness thing. I want to live according to righteousness because that gets, that gets me heaven. Because if we go to what's right and what's just, I'm doomed and have to pay for my own sins. I want to be righteous when I'm in here. I want to do what's right. I want to put God first and my neighbors, my brothers and my sisters. How can I walk around oblivious to them and think I'm praising and worshiping God? Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to the food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. See, when you reap to the flesh, you reap corruption, but when you sow to the righteousness, you reap righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I am many are generous at every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, you have to understand, Paul is addressing the Corinthians regarding an offering they promised to send the believers in Jerusalem. He reminds them that if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. He goes on to say that God, in response to abundant and cheerful sowing, will increase the supply so their generosity will continue. God wants you to be generous because he wants to continue the generosity. He didn't bless you for it to stop with you. He blessed you so that you could be generous so he continued to give for you. And it kind of, see, you talk about money, everybody gets all sticky. I'm not going to take up an offering after this tonight. I'm not. Relax. So the abundant cheerful sowing will increase the supply so that generosity will continue to grow to the point that they will have the ability to give on every occasion. Let me tell you how you undercut yourself. Oh, there's a need to come out. Oh, I'm going to give that much to it. You didn't even ask God. 
You didn't even consider the concept of sacrifice because you wanted the generosity to continue. You see, what God was saying through Paul was, the statement right there was the real intent of what God is trying to do. He is trying to get something to you rather than from you. But sadly, some of you give like God's trying to take from you rather than give to you. Many times we say, well, why isn't God doing this in my life? Why isn't God? Well, somewhere, someplace, there needs to be an audit. Somewhere, someplace, there's something stuck. And trust me, it's not God. How many of you would like to see God bless you to the degree that you can be generous on every occasion? Well, I got one. Okay, so the rest are dismissed. Erica, come up here. I'm going to preach to you. You see, we have to learn we will not see what we do not sow. You will not see what you do not sow. The seed sitting at your house. The seed sitting at the bank. The seed sitting in your wallet. The seed sitting in your heart. If I sparingly sow, then I sparingly reap. When's the last time you laid hands on someone and they were healed? When's the last time you laid hands? When, when, what is sparingly? Sparingly denotes a bare minimum that I must meet. In other words, okay, okay, God, what is the dollar amount that I can give that breaks out of the sparingly bracket? What makes me look like a good giver. What makes me feel like a good giver? When pastor goes over, hey Dave, I don't go over. The, no, I don't do that. I don't look. I pray and hope that you're all good givers. Because you'll always be generous. But when I catch a stingy tightwad, I recognize, oh, okay. But I don't look at the books. I don't want to look at the books. Now and then I have to, but no. If, if, if you promote yourself as leader or minister, I'm going to look at your giving. Because you got no, no, if you're not going to be a giver, if you're not going to be on time, for, if not take the basic tenets of Christianity, honest, take a seat, get those aligned, and come back. Amen? So what's the dollar amount that I can give that gets me out of the sparingly bracket, God? I would suggest to you that sparingly has nothing to do with the amount and everything to do with the approach. Remember Jesus praised. Listen to me, folks. I need you to listen to me. The widow who gave the smallest offering to mites. It says he also saw a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living she had. Te technically, Jesus wasn't moved by the amount. He was, a, he was touched by the approach. He was moved by the attitude. Because if you think about it, with what was being given, the two mites was kind of laughable. Some of you may sit back and laugh about how much more you give than somebody else. And God sits back, oh, that got my attention, whereas yours? Uh, no, see, I know you're giving all that over there. You, you think you're bad and all that. But that little old person over here, that little child, oh, you ought to see their attitude. You ought to see their approach. I'm, God is drawn to that person, whereas you, yeah. Why? Why was he drawn? Because her gift was a generous gift that was sown out of need. I want to put emphasis on your approach to God. You don't talk about this subject. Your approach, when you came in here tonight, when you come in here on Sundays, we got, we got a few days of prayer and fasting where anytime between 6 and 8 p.m., come down here for prayer. It's about your approach. It's about your thinking about God. Stop thinking you can strong arm or bribe. 
Can, can we be real right there? Listen, I, I had a man in the first church I pastored. I always knew when he was bribing God. He had a deal. I knew when something was coming down the pipe. All of a sudden, boy, he'd make a big show. Oh, I'm putting something in offer. And I was like, okay. I get it, but he missed it. It's your attitude towards it. It's our attitude. It's your spiritual temperature. It's really about your heartbeat. My concern is that when it comes to giving and serving God, many have a tendency, if unchallenged, to try to approach and operate or get by with the bare minimum. Right? How many went to school? Look, I, I get it. I want to pass the test with minimal effort because I got other things I want to do. But I'm afraid serving God doesn't fall into that minuscule category. This is a little bit more important than that. So I believe I can make that assertion because so many people waffle and resist the concept of the tithe and offerings. It's funny how many want to appear successful until the plate gets passed. You're a big shot until their offering plate comes. You know, the tithing first appears in the Old Testament hundreds of years before the Ten Commandments. So don't say, oh, it went out with the law. No, it didn't. Because it didn't start with the law. Know your Bible. It is a concept, what is called the first fruits, not dispensations. First fruits is the very first thing we should do. It's out of gratitude. It's that understanding that, you know what, God, I am so thankful today. I'm going to make an offering back to you to let you know how, how grateful I am for your faithfulness, for providing for me. Listen, kids, there comes a point when you have to realize you can't base it on mom and dad. You got to say, oh, I'm glad what God's doing for me. It's admitting that we understand that what we have is from him. If you came from my background, if you came from my life and how my life started out and how I got here, let me tell you something. I didn't get here because of me. I, did, I may have done some work along the way, but he gave me the power to work. He gave me the mind to think. He, 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 he's the one. I, I'm going to touch Well, I put in those hours. If he hadn't have bought me and purchased me and redeemed me, I couldn't have done anything that I done. I didn't get. It would be quick and easy to think, like, oh, my skill of oration and my talent. Oh, no. Please. Please. If God hadn't intervened, some of us wouldn't have made it out of, well, it's admitting and without him, we would not have anything that we have. And so this is translated into modern church. That, well, we pay a tithe. A tithe is a, Simply illustrated is that, you know, if we have $10, we give one to God. And so basically it's supposed to redeem or blesses the other nine that we live on. Ah, that's very shallow, but okay. I want to back up a minute because I understand the resistance. I do. I expected to see the struggle. I expected to feel it. I hear people say all the time, tithing is an Old Testament concept, but they haven't read their Bible because Matthew 23, 23 says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees. Listen to this. I'm not just, get past, get, get past worrying about giving. It's, 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 it's there. Get the essence. Understand. Audit your approach to the Word of God tonight. I don't care how long you've been around here or how short. Audit your approach to God. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees. Be careful, you really religious folks. Hypocrites, you pay tithe of the mint, the anise, and the cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, of, of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. What's he saying? You need to audit everything about your life. You all step back a minute here. Another version says it this way. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. That word faith. 
You should tithe, yes. But don't neglect these other important things. It wasn't done away with. In fact, under Jesus and the New Testament, it's emphasized. He says there are important things just like the tithe, judgment, mercy, and faith. But you can't dismiss them. You've got to do them all. They work together. You can't dismiss any of them. You can't say, well, bless God, look at me. I just forgave them. Wonderful. Excellent. I, I, but weren't you forgiven? Oh. Wait a minute. So wait a minute. Okay, hold on. Y'all got that, right? Well, I gave and paid my pays. What do you want us to put a banner up? Weren't you given to as well? I receive mercy, I give mercy. Why, why, why? Don't, let me tell you something. The mercy that you give, you receive. Why? Hey, how many like that? I like, I, wait a minute, let me, let me put this right. There's some times I wanted to. F In fact, some of y'all were joking with me last night about, hey, pastor, you need help sleeping? They won't give me that right hook. They ain't going to put me out and I just look at me. I ain't that guy. It's going to be on like Donkey Kong. You come at me like that. I'm sorry, but I'm a little deficient in the Holy Ghost. The problem, you have to understand So I might let you hit me. The problem is if I don't have enough Holy Ghost to stop me from hitting you back. Now, I'm kidding around here, but I want you to get the point. Don't put on a brownie button because you, oh, I forgave their debt. Or I've done this, or I gave here, or I, audit your approach and your attitude right now. James 2 says this, Yet a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I show you them my faith by my work. What are you doing to prove your faith today? What have you actually done lately to prove your trust? You may have slipped. You may have let go. You, you may have let them slip, like the writer of Hebrews said. And, said. and you're trying to live on what you did before, but God's given you so much since then. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, don't you know that faith without works is dead? Listen to me use this here. This is, a, this is a head slap moment right here. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son up on the altar? I, I think we can all say that giving his son is way beyond the tithe. Abraham was the line of demarcation that he used. When's the last time you gave everything, your dreams, your hopes, and your God-given promises? There's your line. That doesn't sound too sparingly, does it? Ouch. Say, say ouch. Just say ouch. Everybody say ouch. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect? How many knows what was said to the rich young ruler when he walked away? Give, and you'll be made perfect. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. God's never approached with me with just one thing I need to do to be perfect. I don't want really his list, and I really don't want my wife's list, because they're probably too long. I'd be very depressed. <laughs> now, I don't know, Brother Joe, Brother, Brother Corey, you all may be, Brother Davenport, you may be next to perfect and have one thing you like. I, I think I got a few more to work on. But let me tell you, I'm auditing my approach because I'm going to continue to work to be better. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. What have you done? When's the last time you audited your approach? Because you have to actually do things that involve faith. You have to actually do things that involve trust. 
You actually have to do things in, in, in our giving that punctuates our faith. You can't say, I have all faith in God and never put yourself in a situation to prove it. Our giving gives credibility to the profession of our faith. I'll never forget as a brand new convert, Brother Monroe, I watched him pay tithes. I was like, I mean, I'm sitting right, he was, he was right there in church. I looked at him, I was like, you have to understand, I, I was over him at work. And I'm like, how much you giving? None of your business. And I watched him drop a lot of cash in me. Sat there, it's my stingy attitude, my worldly attitude, and I'm thinking, And I thought, man, I started seeing all the attributes of God in his life that I lacked. Here's this guy caring, up, caring about me, picking me up for church, spending time with me, teaching me about, here he's giving, giving, giving. And I realized this man is way different than me. You know what he's causing me to do? Audit me. Listen, if, if all of a sudden you start praying more than me, I'm going to audit me. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not going to drive home in the car and tell my wife, ah, oh, he's this, and he's this, he's this. Some of you have told on yourselves to your own spouses. Some of you have damaged your own family members because you've, you've audited the pastor. You've audited people's motives. You've audited and you've ridiculed and condemned, and you don't even realize that your weight in the balance is found water, and you damaged people that would have been willing to give all. And God would have been so generous. They'd be full of the Holy Ghost. They would have been amazing people in the kingdom of God. But you audited what you're in your opinion, and you stole from them their ability to serve the Lord. You ripped out of their hands the idea of being generous, and you, your stinginess went throughout your family, and now every one of them just barely on the Friends, if we've been coming to church. It's, it's funny. I, I don't want my son to be a chip off the old block. I don't want my daughter. How, how, many, how many wants them to be? No, no, no. I tell Eric all the time, you got to be better than me. You have no excuse because I promise you, I'm going to give you everything I know, everything I have, and now you run with it knowing what I've already got. You should do better. Where do we get the idea that, bless God, I'm the epitome of godliness. I'm going to sit at the head of the table. I'm all that in a bag of chips. Watch my Christianity. Oh, my God. Some of us need to audit ourselves, especially if you're going to call yourself a leader. If he's going to be greatest among you, let him be your, he that will be greatest among you, let him be. When's, when's the last time you served? Where do we get to the point, well, now serve me? Wait a minute. God holds that position. Are you hearing me? It's just like baptism. If you believe, you get baptized in his name, and you just don't talk about it, right? So Jesus, in fact, says we ought to do this, right? How many knows you need to get baptized in Jesus' name? You got to repent. He says, get, repent of your sins, get baptized in Jesus' name, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many believe that? Really? Are you sure? Remember you said that. We wholeheartedly agree that when Jesus says we are to love our neighbors, that we should. When Jesus declares that we ought to forgive, we say we should. When he says we are to love God, we say we should. When he says we need to love our neighbor, we know we should, right? But then all of a sudden, when he states clearly that we ought to tithe, suddenly that principle gets thrown out. Here's the truth. Jesus changes the bare minimum. He, he, didn't, he didn't just say tithe. In fact, Old Testament, the amount of tithing was depending on who you speak to and depending on someone's level of Jewish background was closer to more 17 to 23 percent and not 10 Let's take some baby steps tonight. 
If we fast forward to the New Testament, and the people that wanted to contend that as New Testament believers, we're not bound by Old Testament, I will agree we are not bound by the law, but covered by grace. The only problem is that Jesus has changed. Jesus changed the bare minimum. It didn't go the way you think it did. He calls us to, to an entirely different level of living and giving and being than, well, we don't have to do it anymore because it's Old Testament. You're not, you haven't read your Bible. Matthew 5, 27, 28 says, You have heard, he's talking about it, it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's in the law, right? But I say unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after hath committed adultery already in heart. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. He just took it to a, a more greater level, not less. So you can see how Old Testament was a lot less invasive. You see, God is getting into your heart. Listen, folks, it's not something to run from. This is something to grab a hold of. Listen, he says in Matthew 19 and 29, and everyone who's given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. What? How, quick show of hands. How many knew that? Raise your hand. It wasn't if you give these things up. Jesus is assuming this is a foregone conclusion to a believer that as one of his followers, you're going to operate at a higher standard of living, of giving, of sacrifice, of grace, mercy. He is inserting that the standard in the New Testament really wasn't 10%. 100%. It's all in. Oh, God, i got to audit myself. So the New Testament standard is a whole lot higher than the Old Testament. Those folks who are stuck using the Old Testament have missed the New Testament. If your contention is that you're, you're a New Testament believer, right? I know the New Testament. I'm under grace, not the law. That's great because then I want to challenge you to actually abide by and live up to the New Testament standard. Are you ready? Some fix. You know, past. You know, Pastor. I waited to the last pitch. You know, it's coming. I want to live up to the New Testament standard because that's what we see the disciples do. How many is ready? If you agree with what I'm reading, tell me. Give me an amen. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Remember, this is all the same dialogue here. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord of God shall call. And with many other, wor other, 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 other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. How do we save ourselves from this untoward generation? Not just Acts 2.38. Let's read on, folks. Are you with me? Follow along in your Bible. Get your textbook out. Then they that gladly, you still glad? We're auditing. Are you glad? <laughs> Oh, I want to get this now, not when I'm standing before God. Let me get this now. It's bad, but I, got, I got a minute to fix it. And they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day were added in them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You know what I'm saying? And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. You still with me, Mr. Old in New Testament? And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness. I wonder where your gladness went. 
Come on, preacher. Come on, disputer of this world. Come on, man, lady of God. That's My God. I've been reading it wrong, huh? Did eat their meat with gladness and single, single, singleness. That doesn't mean you're single, folks. But you can still do it when you're single later. Singleness of heart. You see, because he knows a divided heart. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so, so I, I, get, I know some of y'all think you're big givers. But I've been around this thing a long time. And I find those that think they are really haven't been paying attention. See, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You ever been around someone? God's good all the time. But then you get around someone, you think God's been really good to them, but they ain't got nothing good to say. Listen to what's next. Praising God. Watch church when service is going on. Watch church. You find it's in poor people. They worship it. You want to know who's down there more than rich people? I don't know if this is God or not. Of course you don't. I don't know if this, I don't know if he's doing right. Of course you don't. You haven't had gladness in your life. You haven't had a singleness of heart. You want to be glad? Get with Sister Carla on outreach. People that are grateful because they're in the church. How can you hate the church when you're grateful for it? How can you be upset with outreach when you're grateful that you were reached? Some of us, we think we own the corner on preaching and teaching when what we really need is an altar experience and get renewed. Like a prison set free, some of us have been imprisoned by our own stinking thinking and having favor with all the people and the Lord added. The Lord ain't going to add to a church. They ain't got no gladness in it. Lord ain't going to add to a church when you're a stingy tightwad. Lord ain't going to add to the church because you think you're the epitome of Christianity. You want to know what gets people when they see you, the leader, in an altar. No one's impressed by you being all glorified. God's got that corner. You better put that trip down. I'm saying I get around people, Brother Jacob, you keep on praying, you keep on fasting, you keep on living for God, you keep on being humble. Just trying to keep doing outreach, keep teaching Bible study, keep going after it. Because that's what draws the attention. Not those that, well, I've done it all. I ain't got nothing I gotta do now. Ain't my job. I thought job was to praise God, exalt him in every area of my life. You find out when you stop doing that, you get stingy, you get ungrateful, you get bitter, you don't want to be here, you get upset, you're more like, do we have to? But when you've been redeemed and you understand how God, you get to, I get to. Where's all my get to people tonight? Where's all my get to apostolics tonight? Where's all my get to? I get to. And the Lord added to the church daily. At such a, when you get glad and you get to, God's going to fill the house. God's going to fill the house. And there ain't no way he can fill this house without filling your house. Let me finish up here. And all, the other version says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So if we want to be disciples, why don't we abide by that same standard? You know, some of you new people, I, I very rarely... When I'm out street meeting people and I start talking to people about God, I don't tell them I'm the pastor. 
Because a title means nothing if you don't have a life to back it up. I don't want to walk around and yet, you know, the other day, who was preaching? They called me bishop. And I am the bishop, but you're not going to hear me calling myself the bishop. I'd rather so and say, man, I, he's the real deal. We got too many people wanting titles that don't want to pay tithe of all. Just what's comfortable. They don't want to put God first. They, they, let's just get this down to 10%. I don't want to be all in. Do you realize that when you go read that, everybody's needs were met because of their approach to sowing, to giving? Ah, bless God, I'll throw a couple of bucks that direction. As long as it don't affect me, you just missed it. I want to understand our problem isn't with 10%. It's not. It's with obedience. It's with gratitude. It's with our love of money. It's with the American dream. It's with our, can, can I tell you what, the moment the trumpet sounds, how important is the American dream going to be that you've got your claws dug into? Our struggle is with our approach. Our struggle is with our flesh, our, that worldly mindset that creeps in an attitude. So, so, for too many of us, we've kind of adopted the mentality of, let me get by with as little as absolutely necessary. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a complete dork. I'm an idiot. When I was going to school, I'll never forget a teacher gave me something. This is in England. Give me a assignment. I want you to write for 20 minutes. I thought I was so slick. Man, I'm so, so sat down. Box in front of me. 20 minutes, I stop. Throw my pen down. That's right. I did as I was told. My dad come walking by. He's a military man. What's this? Yeah, in England, you have to understand your teachers are professors or serves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was in England. Yes, sir. So I will. And our, our principal was the headmaster. Right here. Well, why'd you stop mid sentence? Because the teacher told us to only write for 20 minutes, and that was the end of 20 minutes. You want to get under the skin of a leader? Do the minimum. You want to get under. How, how, I, I, hold on a minute here. I learned something about God here. Back when I'm a little kid, I didn't even met the Lord yet. I'm learning. What? You, he didn't use these words, but it's pretty, you get your narrow behind back in here and you finish this. So he said, we, we, we don't do stuff halfway in this house. Why is it that we want to be the big shot with how we look out there and the big shot, how we, we come in here, ah, do you realize what a stench that is in the nostrils of God? That's like those, well, I was putting all that money in that lady with two mites comes in. What a beautiful picture we were given. God saw our approach. God watches us. That means, hey, folks, I don't care where you're at demographically. I don't care where you're at financially. I don't care where you're at. So I don't care where, anybody can come in here and live for God because it's all about your approach. Not coming here thinking, how many things God owes you? I'm not getting into that. So what sadly happens is tithe and offering is treated more like a tax than a testimony. We treat tithing like it's inferior to forgiveness, love, and mercy. We, it's treated as optional rather than opportunity. We treat the things of God like it's a penalty rather than a privilege. Can I get, can I get in it? anybody, anybody, am I in anybody's living room today? You see, if our approach changes, then we realize we don't have to give. We get to give. And the incredible thing is that he blesses me when I do. And he allows me to keep what is really all his. And he can write, you, see, you realize that? I've just kept what was all his. 
The struggle with approach is it new. The earliest believers struggled as well. The account that shows us struggle immediately follows another assertion that 100% belongs to God. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them aught of the things which he possessed with his was his own, but they had all things common. And, listen to this, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Do you see what happened there? Power comes from when you're all in. All the believers were united in heart and mind. The whole church felt that they that what that that, that what they had was not really their own. It was went by God to be dispersed. So they shared everything they had. They took care of each other. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Let's stand. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like, the, like in the, thou shalt love the Lord as thyself. Do you really see caring for one another as optional? Do you really see as going all in with God as optional? I'm going to finish with something, so play very quietly. There's a situation that happens with the Acts church. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. You realize they made a show of their giving. They're in the Ananias and Sapphira are in the New Testament church. They sell some land. They secretly manipulated and kept it, kept it back and they showed up to present a large offering because everybody was giving all that they had. So they wanted everybody to think that they were doing the same. That's the danger. You want people to think you're something you're not. They were posing as if they'd met the high standard of 100%. And the Holy Spirit puts them on public blast for their deceit. And they were struck dead instantly. Was the amount too small? Did God need that little bit that they kept for themselves? No. Was it because they had not given 100%? No. The problem wasn't the amount. The problem was the approach. So the question I ask in regards to giving is not how much. It isn't even about whether you're given the bare minimum of 10% or reaching for the higher standard of 100%. I guess I want to challenge everyone in the room whether you fall in the 37% statistically that give or the 63% that don't. Because unless your approach is right with God, let's get honest in our hearts. Can we audit our hearts? Can we audit our love? Audit our faith? In other words, it's not about walking softly and humbly because that can mask arrogance and pride. Because people think you have the image of that, but you don't have the work. So, so let's audit our approach. Well, how do I do that, Pastor? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on what we realize Jesus is really saying. Are you ready? Why don't we see how much we can do rather than trying to see how little we can get by with? Why don't you really get honest with what you can do rather than how little you can get by with? Our approach to God determines if we'll reap sparingly. If our approach is marked by generosity and obedience, then we will discover that Scripture is true. And as we give generously, in fact, let's see if God will make it possible for us to be even more generous in the process. Because if He can give it through you, He can give it to you.
And so we are admonished to bring all the tithes into the storehouse and there maybe meet in my house. Prove me. I mean, God's so good. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and it shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast forth her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Years ago, there lived a young man born in poverty in India. He was forced to beg for a living. His family could not afford to pay for school. The young man grew as a beggar and he never owned any land, no visible means of support. His parents died and left him alone. He was forced to live off the generosity of others. The young man carried her out an old cup everywhere with him and held it out to beg, hoping to receive grains of rice from his fellow villagers. On his best days, he might get the cup half or three quarters full of rice, barely enough to get a meager meal. But one day as the young man sat in his customary position on the dirt road leading to town, he noticed some activity up the road. There was something that was moving towards the village. He strained to look and he realized a huge procession of people and there were animals and all sorts of things began to take shape in the distance. He could see soldiers and now flags and flag bearers and, and, and in their bright uniforms leading the way. And what came behind the soldiers caused him to jump up and his heart leap in his chest. A procession of elephants was coming and in India that could only mean one thing. The king was coming through the village. The great king was coming through the village. All the villagers had heard and a rumor spread. And no one had ever seen him in person. It was almost unbelievable that their king was actually here coming to their town. Quickly the young beggar realized and began to move to a place in the road where they couldn't miss seeing him when the possession passed. He knew this was a once in a lifetime chance to actually receive something of value in his beggar's cup. This is a chance to, to get something more than he's ever gotten before. His quick actions worked and it put him at the front of a large crowd of people. There he stood in his tattered clothes and his old cup. Finally, the formation of soldiers reached the edge of the village and began passing by the beggar. And just as the lead elephant was approaching the man's position, a command rang out. The elephant stopped. The man could not believe his fortune. He was in the perfect spot. It was the king on his elephant that was before him. With another command, the elephant dropped to one knee and the king dismounted. Soldiers quickly surrounded the king and the king moved toward the crowd. The beggar began to wave his hands and shout and wave his cup, wanting to be noticed. The king's attention was instantly put to the beggar and he walked directly towards Looking at the man's cup, the king asked, how much rice do you have? That was not the question the man had expected. And it caught him off guard. Why would the king want to know how much rice I had? He, he's got all the rice in the world. Why, 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 what does he want to know how much rice I got? Half a cup, he replied. The king asked another startling question that just caught his breath. He said, may I have all of it? What? I, the beggar thought to himself, I was hoping to get a huge reward from him, and now he wants all that I have? His voice quivering, looking in his bowl, well, your highness, this is all the rice I have to my name. 
You can have half of it. The young man dejectedly handed the king the cup. The king then took the cup, turned his back, and poured half of the rice into a servant's pouch. He then handed the cup back to the beggar. Without another word, stepped back, got on his elephant, and the procession continued. As quickly as it all happened, it was over. Utterly dejected, the young man sat on the roadside with his head in his hands. It happened so fast, I had a chance for riches and come and gone quickly. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? After a few moments of tears and despair, he looked into his cup to see how much rice was left and how much the king had actually taken. When he looked into the cup, his jaw dropped. For every grain of rice that the king had taken, he had returned a golden nugget. In anguish, the young beggar cried out, if only I would given him everything. You see, if we approach what we have with the understanding that it's all really his, then we don't have a problem giving more.